Salam alaikum, brothers and sisters. Uh, we can do a little better than that. We need to get the energy flowing. Salam alaikum, brothers and sisters. All right, it's a little better. Again, my name is uh, Abdul Salam, also known as Ensel Pratt the Third. Uh, I'm the uh, have the esteemed honor to introduce a great man of conviction and principle who's going to be speaking to you a little later on tonight, Brother Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Um, I'm also very humbled that Why Islam asked me to take five minutes just to share with you my brief story about how I uh, embrace El Islam. And to make sure we stay on point, I actually got my timer right here for everyone. So, <laughs> so just to give you a quick heads up, um, my name is Ensel uh, Abdul Salam. I'm the project manager for Ways Royal Foundation, which is the uh, foundation that was started by three-time NBA champion Mr. Dwayne Wade. Prior to starting with uh, working with uh, Ways Royal Foundation, I worked eight years with the Miami Heat inside the Community Affairs Department. So whenever you've seen the Heat players giving out Thanksgiving turkey baskets towards the kids in the hospital, that's what I coordinated for them. My journey to Islam started uh, back in 2000, or excuse me, back in 1999. But to start back from that, I'm a native South Floridian, came from very humble beginnings. Growing up, my family taught me two important things. One is that nothing will ever be given to you. And two, the single greatest thing that I can do for myself is to never let anyone define me or my capabilities to be able to strive for what I'm looking for. Now, since we're keeping with the sports theme, uh, any, I, I, played high school ap, uh, I played high school sports. So in high school, I was on the varsity football team, varsity wrestling team, captain and company commander of the JROTC program, and I was on the yearbook staff. Going into my senior year, one of the things I was most proud about is uh, I became a beast in the weight room. I was five foot eight, 160 pounds, bench pressing 275 pounds. My goal was to hit 300 pounds before I graduated, and then it happened. October 11, 1996, during the district high school football game, I was rammed on the side of the head, hyperstending my spine, ripping my C5 and C6 nerve, and tearing my chest muscle completely off of my collarbone. I know some of you may have probably had the experience where you fell asleep before on your arm and woke up and couldn't move it for maybe about five or 10 seconds. I had to go 18 months of my life like that until I had nerve reconstructive surgery just to be able to raise my arm above my head. And that's when it really began. The quest for me to be able to find out why did this happen to me, the purpose of life, and how to be able to overcome that. Through that is the time when I started to soul search between the existing religion that was in my household, which is Christianity, and trying to find a connection to, to the purpose of life. From there, it led me to 2000 and 2000 that I kind of separated myself from being uh, the Christian faith and saw myself as just being a spiritual person where I believed in God, uh, but fellow hood, the fellow brothers, because I didn't know much about El Islam. And it wasn't until college at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton where I had some individuals who were part of the MSO who invited me out to a Halakha meeting. I went to several of the Halakha meetings where left a lasting impression on me. I didn't wind up taking Shahada until approximately four years after that, but I got to give credit to those young people who stepped up and gave me an opportunity to be able to share some of the same literature that Why Islam have to me on that college campus today. So if I can give any word of advice for anybody that's in here that's Muslim, is don't be afraid to be able to step to someone and be able to share the beauties about our deen with them. You never know that you may be a person to help them with being able to make, it, make the journey to El Islam. So salam alaikum with that. And without any further ado, again, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd like to um, Humboldt to be able to introduce Brother Mahmoud Abdul Raoul. He was born Chris, uh, Chris Wayne Jackson on March 6, 1969. He is a former professional basketball player. He played nine years in the NBA and, was mar uh, and made his mark as a slam, uh, during the slam dunk contest, as well as being one of the most accurate free throw shooters ever on record. He's considered one of the greatest free throw shooters in the history of the game. And, uh, and Brother Abdul uh, Raouf missed the all-time free throw uh, shooting uh, record in 1993-1994 season by a single free throw shot. After the NBA, he played in multiple uh, leagues around the world. And again, today, he is a role model, a community leader, and an extreme example setter. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our brother, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Good 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم uh, first and foremost as is customary with me and, and necessary i want to thank allah for being here and for you being here you know we all could have been doing something else with our time but we decided to come here this evening and and share this moment together so i want to thank allah for for you and, and for allowing us to be here. And there's a saying that you can't truly thank Allah without being able to thank his creation when they do something good. So I'd like to also thank uh, Ikna and Why Islam Project for inviting me to speak this evening also. Uh, you know, it's beautiful to see all of us here together. You know, when I look at the little, the, the, younger, the younger generation with the skit that they performed earlier, it, it takes a lot of bravery uh, to get up here and be able to do that in front of, you know, in front of people. And uh, it's just beautiful seeing all the stories, you know, that preceded me. Uh, you know, you, you hear people saying, well, it's hard to condense 25, 30 years in, in five minutes. But those five minutes, you know, of information is, is like an ocean of information that, that, that's worth a lot if you, if you reflect on it you know, the, the, the experiences that you've gone through. So I appreciate your stories as well. Actually, coming to these events, I was saying earlier, uh, I, en I enjoy this sitting here or standing here speaking with you, but more so I enjoy sitting because you, you, you learn so much when you hear what people have to say, the experiences that they've gone through. So I'm, I'm very grateful, again, by Allah, that, that we all can be here and that you've shared those stories. Uh, there's a story that came to me months ago and, and it's hard for me to resist sharing it with you in terms of community before I get into my little talk about some of the experiences that I've gone through. Um, and it was shared to me months ago. A uh, brother told me there was this anthropologist uh, that created this game among African children. And he put a basket of fruit at a distance underneath a tree. And it speaks of the value of community, the type of, you know, the things that we can get accomplished, the spirit that we should have. Well, at any rate, he told these kids, he said, if whoever could reach that basket of fruit first could have it all to themselves. And he was under the impression that this uh, selfishness that sometimes we as human beings have was going to kick in. They were going to be selfish and they were going to rush. They were going to be greedy to get to the fruit. But they all grabbed hands together and they ran to the tree together. So they got there together, so they were able to eat and enjoy the fruits together, and the anthropologist was perplexed. So he wanted to know why, what made you do that? They said Ubuntu, which means uh, I, uh, how can I be happy when the rest of us are sad? And they said Ubuntu is a, a philosophy among African tribes that I am because we are. You know, so all of us make each other, make, make everyone else better. And, and this, is a, this is a great thing. And sometimes as individuals also, we feel that, that there's not much we can do. You know, we're limited. But really just, like as brothers were saying before, a smile, you know, a kind gesture that goes a long way. We never know how Allah blesses those little gestures that we have. And one more story before I begin. A story, and many of you may have heard it, but I just love these stories, uh, about a little girl walking on a beach. And she saw a lot of starfish kicked out of the ocean, thousands of them. And so she began to kneel down and pick them up and throw them back. And this guy saw her. He said, what are you doing? You can't possibly make a difference, you know, with all of these starfish out of the ocean. So she thought about it, and she doubted it. So she put the starfish down. Moments later, she thought again. She picked it back up, and she threw it in the water. He said, what are you doing? She said, I made a difference with that one. And it influenced him so much that he began to help her. So he started throwing it. Every time he threw it in, I made a difference with that one. Before you know it, it was a multitude of people throwing starfish back into the ocean. And every time they threw one in, said, I made a difference with that one. Until moments later, the, 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 the noise subsided. She looked around. All the starfish was gone. And so that individual effort produced a collective effort that brought about change. So alhamdulillah, 
this is, this is what meetings like this are about, and I hope that, you, you know, we'll continue. Um, I was fortunate to play nine years in the NBA. Uh, I came from the south, uh, state of Mississippi. Uh, I grew up in uh, the ghettos of Mississippi, a place called Syria City. Uh, S-O-R-I-A. We call it Syria, though, but it's Saria. And I grew up in a family where my mother had an eighth grade education. Uh, I was surrounded. I mean, you saw the prostitution. You saw the, the drug addiction. Uh, economically depressed area. Aesthetically unappealing area. And, you know, in areas like that sometimes, especially growing up and your mother only has an eighth grade education, and she would encourage us. She would encourage us constantly to get an education. But there's only so much you can give us, you know, when you yourself don't, when you yourself, it's, it's so much you can do for us. It's hard to give us what you yourself don't have. It's hard to, to instill in us a routine of learning when you don't have that routine yourself. And so sometimes growing up under those conditions, you doubt yourself. You doubt your, in, you, you doubt your intellect. You start looking at yourself as inferior uh, because of the environment that you're growing in, being told that, you know, because your mother has an eighth grade education, you, and, and, and you start looking down on yourself. And these things, sometimes in that environment, you can begin to think that, you know what, you become a victim of, of your environment. And you think, well, this is my fate. This is what I'm going to become. And so just live with it. But I was blessed. I was really and truly blessed at an early age, about eight or nine years old, uh, to know what I wanted. And like a lot of kids nowadays, and even sometimes adults, sometimes people go through college and they take courses and then they go through two, three years and realize, man, that's not what I want. And they change their courses. But at the age of eight, nine years old, Allah blessed me at that age to know what it was that I wanted. And for me, I wanted to be the best basketball player that I could become. And the sad thing, the beautiful thing is that I understood that at that age. But the sad thing is that at that time, I didn't know that I had better chance at becoming a doctor or a lawyer statistically than becoming a basketball player. I never got that memo until later on that you could have, your, 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 your chances were better at that because it was at that time like one out of 750, 80, uh, 800,000 that would make it in the NBA. Now those numbers has skyrocketed because of, you know, overseas market and everything else, so it's, it's much more then. But at that age, I knew this is what I wanted. And Allah put it in me. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you some before I get into the, how I became a Muslim, because it, it, it all leads up. But as uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes that mental amnesia kicks in, so I might ask y'all what I was just talking about. It's been a long day. You remember, right? What was I just saying? Uh, uh, excuse me? How I became Muslim? What? See, we're not listening, right? Can somebody help me? What was I just talking about? Huh? What? Before? I knew what I wanted to become as a basketball player. So I began at an early age. Alhamdulillah, I began to, Allah blessed me at 8 or 9 or 10 years old. And I began to chart out a course at that age. And I would wake up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I was waking up for Fajr when I didn't even know what Fajr was. You know, so it was easy when I became a Muslim to do it. But I began to wake up at uh, 4 or 5, 4 o'clock in the morning. And for years, my mother didn't know that this is what I was doing. I would wait until she left to go to work. She had to be there by 5. And I was determined. I mean, it was like, I, for me, it was like, it wasn't, playing basketball wasn't always, I loved to play. I enjoyed it, but it wasn't always fun. For me, and it wasn't, it wasn't just I wanted to play, I felt I needed to play to survive. Because I felt this was the only chance I had to make it. And it was sad as a kid to think that, to think that this is your only out. But in one, in, in, if you look at it in another way, it's a beautiful thing because now you don't leave yourself a B or C option. There's only A. And if I don't make it, it's over. So I got to give everything I have to make this work. So at that age, I would, I would wake up at 4 o'clock, and it was still dark outside. And I had three courts in three different directions. 
And I would go, and this is an eight-year-old, and I'm trying to put, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm always trying, there's always things I'm thinking about trying to motivate myself. Some days it was getting my, my mother and my brothers out of poverty. Some days it was an opponent I didn't think about. Some days it was one day having a family and children that I have to raise. You know, some days uh, uh, it, was, it was one thing over another, but I always had to dig deep to find out what it was that, you know, that could motivate me. So every day, I mean, I would wake up, and as I'm going to this court, I'm dribbling, and, I'm every, and I would imagine uh, this invisible person, every time I dribbled, it was this close to like clicking, like, like flicking the ball with their fingernails, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to escape, I'm trying to go quick. I'm, I'm getting quicker and quicker. I mean, you would look at me and say, Man, what is this little kid, what are you doing? He's looking crazy out there. But I mean, I wanted it that bad. I, I was oblivious to everything else around me. And because in my, in, in, in my mindset at that time, I said, you know, your imagination is the strongest thing you have. If I can beat my imagination, nobody can stay with me like my imagination can. So I'm, not try I'm trying to escape it, shoot it quick. And so I would do this day in, I would do it day out. It didn't matter with me. At, and, and we didn't always have the best of clothes. There were times I'm going out, I got shorts on, I got a t-shirt. And it's freezing, because we lived about four blocks from the beach. And so that, that air coming off that beach, like, intensified the cold. So here it is. I'm an eight, nine-year-old. I'm stepping outside. It's dark. Some days I wake up. I'm crying. I got tears in my eyes. I said, man, I don't feel like doing this. I'm tired. I'm tired. It was like something would click. I said, no, man, I, I got to do it. It's no choice. I don't have a choice. And, and, and that's, that's a law, blessing that eight, nine-year-old to think that way. To, to, to be disciplined enough to be able to wake up every morning and push yourself to those limits. There were days I literally thought I was going to die. No exaggeration. I would work so hard. <gasps> I, I, I couldn't catch my breath. And I'm trying to dramatize it for you so you can really get a picture of what I'm talking about. I mean, it was intense. It didn't matter if it was 100 degrees outside. It didn't matter if it was freezing cold. I would come home sometimes, 8 and 9. And my mother didn't know this for years. I would come home, and my hands would be frostbitten from playing basketball. And I'm coming to the, I'm coming to the sink, and I was dumb at that. I mean, I didn't know that you're not supposed to put hot water on freezing hands. And I'm coming, and I'm turning the faucet, and I'm trying to turn it on, and, and I'm trying to throw my hands out. And right when I throw my body out and it's done, I'm off to the court again. It's like I couldn't get it. It's like I'm thinking somebody might be working harder than me. I want to be the best. I used to argue with my cousin. He said, you can only be one of the, I want to be the best. This is the drive that I had. And what's beautiful is that I grew up in a family. I didn't grow up in a Muslim home. I grew up in a home of Christians. One thing that they instilled in me, though, the power of prayer. But not just praying for something, and that's it. But as you pray for something, move in the direction of what you pray in. And everything's, everything's on, a, on, a, on a law's time. It's not on yours. And if you believe and if you're patient, Allah will begin to open doors for you. So I was working on that. You know, I was, I was on that premise that, okay, I'm going to believe. And I would pray all the time. And I would ask God, and not just for me, please, God, help me to be able to, to benefit people someday be able to take care of my family, to be able to benefit somebody. Don't, I mean, I, I didn't want it just for me, for selfish reasons. I wanted to be great for other reasons. And this is some of the things that were motivating me as I was younger. So I would constantly, as a young man, I would train and I would train. And a lot began to open doors. I remember in elementary school, uh, we played a team, and the score was like 42 to 40, 43 to 46. And I had 42 of our 43 points. We lost. But I had 42 of our 43. So words started to get around. Who was this little kid? You know, now all those people that used to look at me and they say I used to wake them up in the morning and call me crazy. And I was like, they're seeing the results. And this is how a lot works. There was a game, we lost 36 to 42. I had all 36. So, you know, information started coming out. I, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna speed dial for a minute. I go from uh, elementary school. I'm in the seventh grade, playing for the varsity three years in a row, starting pretty much. I'm on the seventh grade, playing for the 10th grade high school summer league, averaging 21. 
Now, when I was younger, when I was like in elementary, I noticed that my skill level was increasing. And there was a moment during that time that I became cocky and arrogant. Man, I was arrogant. You couldn't tell me nothing. I'm the bomb. I'll destroy you. Right? And one day, this older gentleman, by high school, he, uh, I mean, he got into me so bad. You ain't nothing, you little mm -mm 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 -mm. I mean, and you know, of course, I'm listening to him and I'm playing it off. Like, Man, shut up, you don't, know, you don't know what you're talking about. But he hurt my feelings, really. I mean, he got into my heart. And from that moment, I, I made a choice. I say, from this moment on, I'm never going to display myself in that way. I think humility gets you much more in life than being arrogant. I said, from here, I'm just going to let my actions speak for myself. And alhamdulillah, I don't remember who this person was, but I'm very grateful that this person pulled my coat to that and got on me. But as I began to play, I go to high school. Before I entered the high school, uh, I was named the first team all state before I even touched the ball in high school. And so all of this work, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody a while back, and they said they've done studies that on average, people fail five to seven times before actually succeeding. Sometimes what happens, we give up too soon, and there's only one more step that would have gotten us there. You know, so five to seven times people are going to fail before you succeed. So it's important to continue to strive, to continue to believe, because believe me, Allah opens these doors. And so I'm getting into high school, and I'm already number one, uh, first team all state. My first year, we go, to, we go to the state while I was in high school three years in a row. We, the first year we lost by one, the second two years we win it. I ended up averaging 30 some points for my, my career, probably in high school. As I'm, one of those years, I get a letter to be invited to Princeton, New Jersey. It's the top 100 players in the nation. Coaches from all over the nation are there. This particular year, and you guys are going to know this name that I'm going to mention, Michael Jordan was there. In his prime. I mean, muscular, tight. And uh, he was talking to us. He put us in the stands. And he began to talk to us and about the NBA, the rigors of the NBA, how tough it is. And out of everybody in that stands, he pointed me out. He said, come, here, come, up, come up here, young fella. He gave me the ball. He said, look, I want you to come at me as hard as you can. I'm going to defend you. And I'm looking at him like, I'm not scared. Actually, I'm looking, this is an opportunity. I've been working hard. You know, I've been envisioning this invisible person. I'm playing against this invisible person every day. One, two, three, sometimes one against two, one against three. You know, I'm really challenging myself. OK, if he's the best. I want to see where I stand with this gentleman right here. So I remember getting the ball. I remember getting the ball, and we were at the top of the key, and Michael Jordan was guarding me. And the whole, the whole uh, group of kids were watching. And I gave him a jab step, and I went left. And when I say, I mean, I went, I took off, man, like my life was on the line. And I heard his breathing. He was breathing down my neck. You can hear him like a, like a, like a horse. And I went, if I would have went up this way, he would have blocked it. So I went and I stretched. And as I stretched, I could see his hands about right there. And I flipped it up real fast. It went in. They were like, woo! And I said, I said, alhamdulillah, I said, oh, you know, I, and you know, as athletes, and, and I know he can attest to this, sometimes we do things as athletes. And we've been practicing, but sometimes we pull something out of our hat that, like, where that came from? <laughs> but yet, we don't let the public know that we're surprised. So when I did it, they were like, woo! You know, I walked back like I do it all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? But my heart was like, man, I just scored on Michael Jordan. <laughs> right? So I get it again. He, give, he gives it to me again. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to I'm not gonna do the same thing. So I have the ball here. So I go through my legs, I put it through my legs, I cross over, I go this way, same thing, he's rushing to get it. I flip it up, boom, 
score on him twice. The ball comes out of the net. Alhamdulillah. The ball comes out of the net. I, he asks me to give it to him and tells me to go sit down. I go sit down, and I can remember sitting down. I, I don't remember anything else Michael Jordan said. I was just sitting here. I'm like, man, I just scored. In my head, I'm like, I just scored on Michael Jordan twice. And it was easy. I said, man, wait till I go and tell my boys about this. Man, they ain't going to believe it. But what it did for me, sometimes kids, they get into that moment, they'll pull something like that off, and they get cocky. They feel, I scored on Michael George. I'm there already. For me, it motivated me more. I'm like, man, my, my work ethic is paying off. My belief in Allah is paying off. By being patient, Allah is just opening up doors for me constantly. So I go to LSU. Colleges from all over the world, I mean, all over the nation are recruiting me. I decided on LSU. Why? Because they were the only ones at that time that did not offer me anything. No money. They offered me, because I, I was leery about people who offered me stuff like that, even though I know there's a business behind it. But I didn't want to be, I didn't want to feel obligated. I didn't want that pressure. They told me, look, we promise you, if you come here, we don't believe in seniority rules. If you deserve to play, you'll play. I shook their hand. I said, I can live with that. And I went. There was a guy named Fess Irving that was on the basketball team that was a first-team All-American, was in the McDonald's coming out of high school. I get there. I'm thinking about competing with Fess. Before I get to LSU, Dale tells me Fess quit. I said, what you do? He said he came in with his father. His father said, we heard at the time my name was Chris Jackson, and Chris Jackson is coming to LSU. And we just want to know if, if my son, is, uh, not, if, if he's not going to start, we're going to take our show somewhere else. And so Dale said he felt he was threatened. He said, well, you need to pack your bags and go. So it just left, <laughs> left everything wide open for me. So I get to LSU, and I remember the journalist telling me, and, I'm, I'm, and, and I learned a lesson from the guy that really ratted me out and told me about myself. And I always try to remain humble because you never know what's going to happen. Allah can give it to you and take it away from you just like that. And he asked me, he said, what do you want your career at LSU to say for itself when it's all said and done? I'm coming from Mississippi. I'm undersized, I'm about 5'11 and a half. Well, really, they list me as 6'1", but with shoes on, depending on the heels, I may be probably 6'6 six, six and a half. And he, I said, look, I said, if I can leave LSU averaging 13 points, seven assists a game, Man, I think that'll be one. I'm, I'm being realistic. I'm going to be playing against 6'5", six, 6'7", six, six, guards. They're going to be just as fast, stronger. Wow. But at the same time, in my head, I'm thinking big. But I'm telling you that because it's realistic. My first game, I had like 13 and 7. I was like, okay. We're all right. Second game, I had 21. I started noticing something real strange. My, my roommate came to me. He was like, man, you just scored 21 points. I said, I know. I said, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the next game. I go to my third game. After that second game, Dale stops me. He says, uh, we need you to score more. I said, coach, I'll try. I'll try. My third game, I had 48. I'm a freshman. My, alhamdulillah. My fourth game, I had 36. My fifth game on national television against the number one team in SEC, Florida. Uh, Dwayne, Shinshus, and all of those guys. And I, we were in Gainesville. And I ended up that game with 53, national television. Alhamdulillah. And you, ne and you know when you're playing, you don't really, I don't count, I just play. Because I think when you count, you mess yourself up. I didn't know I had 53. All I remember is when we came into the locker room, assistant coach is shaking me. You just scored 53. You, I said, calm down, calm down, calm down. What? what you, you just scored. I said, they want to see you outside. I'll come outside. And it was a humbling experience, I tell you, and scary at the same time. So I'm walking outside. I'm at Florida. We're in Florida's arena. Soon as I step outside, their fans giving me a standing ovation. It, it, was, it was scary. They're interviewing me. I'm sitting there and I'm saying what I got to say. But the whole time, I'm terrified. Because it, and, and I can feel it now. It makes me tear up. Because 
I was saying to myself, this is happening too fast. I am not supposed to be doing this like this right now. And I noticed something, that the same moves when I was in elementary school, if I could pull up clips right now, junior, they started filming me in junior high. The same things that I was doing in the NBA, I was working on those moves day in and day out religiously, imagining pop, pop, scenarios, getting it off quick. I would even go to the hole, nobody's on me. I'm hit, like I'm hitting somebody trying to, I'm fighting the air. But what happens, the more you do something, it becomes second nature. You start seeing it before it happens. And it was, that amnesia got me again. What was I saying? Last thing I said. I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to find myself. Uh, huh? It hit me before it happened? What hit me before it happened? All right. I'm, I'm going to just start. Well, anyway, as I begin, <laughs> this happens to me on a consistent basis, especially when it's late. Um, um, I really don't know what I was saying just then. Huh? It was happening. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you. It was happening too fast, really. And I remember going on the bus. I remember going on the bus after the game. And I'm literally, I'm looking out, I'm looking out through, I'm, cry, I'm crying like a baby. I'm like, this is, this is not, not supposed to be happening to me like this. And I'm, I'm trying not to let the teammates, I'm looking out the window. I say, miss, the plane going to crash. I'm going to get hit by a car. Something's going to happen. I'm scared. I'm literally, I'm like, I don't want to get on the plane. I'm like, this is not, I'm from Mississippi. I'm undersized. I came from this type of environment. On top of that, I grew up, I didn't know until I got into the 11th grade that I had Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is a neurological disorder. It causes muscle and vocal tics. It's hard to control. And so, for example, if I... If I hit this table, for example, say if this is a tick, and I hit this table, it hurts, but it doesn't feel right. I got I to gotta keep hitting it until my mind and my body are on the same page before I can go on, before I can go. The beauty about it is, it's like being a perfectionist. You know, all those times when I was young, I used to train. It didn't, I would literally train. I would be in my house. You would hear the thunder and the lightning. Pow! Before I even walk out, it's coming down, and I'm tying my shoes. Put my clothes on. I was, obl I didn't, I was oblivious to all of it. It was like, man, I got to go. Nobody's doing this. I'm outside, and it's thundering and lightning. It could strike me at any moment. One day, it hit so bad, and I remember being on the playground. Pow! You could hear it come. You know, you hear it, and it was so loud. Something just hit my insides, and literally, I knew it was Allah. Your inside said, go home. <laughs> enough is enough. You taking this thing too far. So, I mean, I'm, the ball had went out into the field, and so as I'm walking to get it, pow! Please, God, help me. Please help me to get home. And I'm getting my, pow! I'm, you know, I'm walking, pow! And I'm wet. And I'm like, please, Allah. I mean, I wasn't saying Allah at the time, but please, God, help me. I, I, I won't do it no more. I promise if it rains, I'll go inside in the gym. I won't play outside again. You know, I, but, but it, I, was, I was, this is how bad I want it. So, so things were happening so fast for me, and I was terrified. I was scared that, you know, something was going to happen. I got back to uh, Baton Rouge, and I remember telling Day, I was, I was this close to telling Coach Brown, Coach, I love to play the game. But I just want to play home games. I don't want to go on the road no more. Because I was scared that something was going to happen to me. But I had to, you know what, I had to suck it up. I said, you know what, when it's your time, it's your time. I've come too far to turn back now. And I just, I just began, to, I began to work and I began to work and work till Allah blessed me after my second year in the NBA. I was drafted number three first round pick overall. And alhamdulillah. Now I'm leading up what I want to say. All of those struggles that I went through, uh, those challenges that I had to face, 
I mean, the sweat, the tears, the pain. You know, if, if it wasn't for struggles, I don't think we could elevate. If, every, if everything was easy for us, you know, it, it, we wouldn't appreciate it. Things would be meaningless. Struggles are meant, you know, without these struggles, st having struggles helps to elevate us. You know, and that's, this is, you know, Allah, through these struggles, this is what he wants from us. So as I, you know, as, as um, this is the third time. Got drafted number three? I'm going to go back to that point. I got drafted number three. And I'm going to the NBA. But during that whole period, I was still professing to be a Christian. I was, but I was searching internally. And because at LSU, Coach Brown gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X. And at that time, and it's sad. It's a sad, you know, coming out of Mississippi and up until that age, and this, this, this says a lot about the lack of education that I had in the home and outside the home, that up until college, when he gave me that book, I had no idea who Malcolm X was. You know, so I began to read about him, and I became fascinated with how he transformed his life. And so internally I was searching. And I was, I was nobody knew it, but sometimes I put crosses on my shoe. I put crosses in my shorts. You know, but internally I was, I was searching because there were so many questions that I had. And I remember growing up and I would ask my family you know, certain questions. And I got tired of hearing day in and day out uh, either. There's two responses I heard repeatedly. You can't question God or you just got to believe. And it was unsatisfactory to me. I'm like, there has to be an answer. Yeah, there has to be a way to explain this. And so uh, I would... Uh, um, fourth time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm gonna lie. I would. Uh, 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 what was I saying? Who? I was searching for. I, I was searching for the answer. You know, and and I remember uh, getting to. I was I was drafted to the NBA, and when I got to the NBA. Uh, I met this priest because I was still searching and he had a protege named Mark James and I remember him and I became real close and one day we were at the table uh, and, Islam and Islam came up in conversation and I said you're interested in Islam he says yes you I said yes he said well I met this brother named Abdullah who works at the airport he told us we can go to the masjid on Evans Street and get a Quran I said, well, boom, got in the car, we sped to the, to the masjid fast as we could. And I remember opening up the Quran. I don't remember which pages it was, but two to three pages later, I ended up looking at the brother and I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be a Muslim. That's it for me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And so I began to go to the masjid. And there was this janitor, African-American brother who, you know, used to be the janitor for the masjid. And I would speak to him day in and day out about Islam. And after my first year in the NBA, that summer in August, I came back and I ended up embracing Islam. And after I embraced Islam, which was funny, the imam and the other brother that took me into the office, they said, well, you need to choose a name. I wasn't opposed to it, so alhamdulillah, because Allah says in the Quran, when you enter Islam, enter wholeheartedly. So I wanted to come with everything. So I get in there, and I'm, I didn't know any names, so one brother said Mahmoud, the other brother said Abdul Rauf. Come to find out his name was Mahmoud, and the other brother named Abdul Rauf. I said, okay, I'm, I'm, it's all good to me, no problem. But what, what's interesting is when I became a Muslim, that's when the struggles began to increase on another scale. Because now, I used to, they were saying, well, you know what? It might mess up your possible endorsements. Well, I'm not, I'm not, trying to, I'm not accepting Islam for worldly endorsements. I'm accepting Islam because my relationship with Allah, you know, if it's meant to be, it'll be. If it's not meant to be, it won't be. And what happened was they began to play little games. They began to question making salah, fasting. They didn't want me to fast. They said, uh, it's going to mess you up. I said, when I first came to the league, I was overweight. Right? I said, look, I'm, I fast for Allah, not for you. You know, Allah take care of everything. And it's funny that when I began to fast, when I began to fast, I began to lose weight. When I began to lose weight, my game began to go up 
to the point to where Hakeem Olajuwon, I know a lot of you know Hakeem. He used to on fast, he used to on game days, not fast. And one day after the game, we were, we were in the car getting ready to go get something. I said, man, I got to get something to eat because I've been fasting. He said, you've been fasting? I said, yeah. I said, he said, I said, that's all I know. I just came into his land. He said, fast, I'm a fast. I don't know anything about missing, you know, I'm just fasting. He said, you fast, I'm going to fast. So he started fasting. And what's amazing is that one day, the CNN or someone, they did a report. They said, during Ramadan, the Muslim stats have gone up. So now, every year, trainers be like, when is Ramadan? <laughs> right? <laughs> when, when is it? They looking for it now. But they would still play games because the lifestyle is different. You know, in the NBA, you have a lot of people, when they get on the road, they could be married or what have you. They, get, they have secret lives, things you're not supposed to say, you're not supposed to vote. They get out there, they do the, they, their little dirt. And when you're not a part of that dirt, they look at you suspiciously, right? And I, we're doing a book on my life, and, and Dan Issel and, and, and was interviewed, and he was like, you know, I just couldn't understand when we go on these road trips. My mood to go in his room, and you got all these guys be dressed funny coming up to his room, and they be in there all night, two, three, four o'clock in the morning just talking. What does that have to do with me? That don't have anything to do with you. You know, I'm, as long as I do my job, that should be. But this, this tells me, see, they, it was more than basketball. You know, and I used to have to contend with, you know, when we lose, or oh, we got guys, they don't come into the locker room on time, but... Every time before that, when I pray before the game, I come in a little late, I find out where we are, I know the game plan, I do my job, but now when we're losing, you want to pick on the Muslim who's, who, who comes in because he's praying before the games. And so I would have discussions with him, I'd go back and forth with him, until one day, and, 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 I'm, a, and, and I'm, I'm trying to condense all of this life story within 30 minutes instead of five. But I grew up, I grew up... The, Eventually what happened, uh, I stopped standing for the national anthem. This is what kind of cut my career short the first time. And what led to that was, and I'm going to jump to that, what led to that was I began to read more. You know, Allah speaks about ikra, right, reading. Throughout the Quran, you know, thinking, pondering, analyzing things. When I was young, I didn't do that because I didn't grow up in that environment where we had a family where we, we were taught to sit down and come up with solutions or to be critical in your thinking. Yeah, yeah, she would encourage us, get an education, baby. But in a practical sense, it wasn't, it wasn't implemented, right, in the household. So when I became a Muslim, I began to read more. And I, became, I, I began to come in contact with different authors. Not all of them Muslim. But, you know, as the Prophet of Islam says, what knowledge is the lost property of the believer or wise man, wherever you find it, keep it. So I'm listening to Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Govard. I'm reading this stuff, and they're talking about the situations that's going on in the world. And for me growing up as a young black boy in Mississippi, growing up seeing the, the overt racism that I grew up seeing, seeing how sometimes my mother or my, my family members or people I know, when they had to confront people of another race, in particular Caucasians, that... They would, they would be very submissive, like slave-like, but behind their backs, that sort of, sort of. And so you start looking at this, and you say, well, you know what, why can't you say this to them? But what happens is the more you see stuff like that throughout your life, it, it, it starts to play out on you. You start to take up on some of those traits. And I remember growing up, I'm like, I, there were things I wanted to say, but I got nervous. I felt I couldn't say them. And I started I start doing the same things I saw my family doing. But I knew deep down inside that wasn't natural. I don't want to feel like that. I shouldn't be afraid to say what I feel and what I believe. You know, this is not natural. So I had to break, I had to eventually work on breaking those chains. I don't want to be like that. If there's something I got to say, I'm not trying to be a savior. I'm not trying to be that. But if it's something I want to say, if it's something I believe in, then I'm going to say it. And let the chips fall where they may. I don't want to play this game anymore. I don't want to live this life. You know, I don't want to die like that. And I remember telling myself, I'm going to make a commitment that I'm going to live and die with a free conscience and a free soul where anybody likes it or not. And this is what I decided to do. So I began to challenge myself. And my agent at the time uh, was a white guy. And it's not a racial thing, but the things that I grew up seeing, that relationship was there. 
and I was feel nervous when I had to confront people. So I remember one day I had something I had to tell him. I said, well, this is, this is the beginning for me. I got to get through this. So I remember ha uh, asking him, I, I need to meet you in your office. So I met Mr. Miller in his office, and I was nervous. But I said, I got to do it. Because he did some things during, during the process that I didn't like as an agent. So I remember talking to him. I said, listen, Mr. Miller. And it was quick and short. I said, listen. I said, uh, he used to call me son a lot. And I didn't like that. And I said, in these meetings. And he would talk about his son sometimes more than talking about me. And his son was still in high school. So I'm like, uh, listen. I said, I just cut to the chase. I said, listen. I, I had uh, 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 organized this meeting with you. There's a few things I want to tell you. I said, first, I said, when we're in these business meetings, please don't refer to me as your son anymore. I said, I'm not your son. The only, the only, I said, my mother was my, I said, my mother represented my mother and my father. I never knew my father. She was my mother and my father. She's, she's the only one that's going to call me son. So from now on, it's a first name basis for you. And I said, second, I'm like giving him A, B, C, second. When we go into these meetings, you, uh, uh, I said, you work for me. I don't work for you. So you got to represent me. So I'm giving him, you know, I'm getting this load off my, he's looking at me like, where in the world is this coming from? Right? But I, I have to tell him. And right after, he's like, son. And I kind of looked at him. He said, Mahmoud. You know, and then right after that, Bernie, I, I read something in Bernie, I'm on a roll now. You can't stop me now. So I read something in the paper. Bernie Bickerstaff says, Mahmoud Abdurraouf needs to stop. He used a cuss word and play ball. Yeah, may I speak to Bernie Bickerstaff? Yeah, hey, Bernie, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, my mother? Hey, look, I just read something in the paper uh, that, that you said I need to, well, who, you don't need to be, he started cursing me out before I can even finish. Who you think you talking to? I said, look, man, I don't care who you are, what your position is. I said, I ain't some handkerchief head, boom, Negro you think I am. I said, if I never played this, I played it, uh, if I never got paid to play this game, I play it because I love it. But uh, next time you got something to say, you say it to me like a man. You talking that noise about we're a family and we keep things behind closed doors, but you running your mind. He hung up the phone. So I'm on a roll. Now you got to look at this as a life that, uh, that I've lived for years of not speaking, of not coming out. So what happened was it led to me not standing for the flag, right? Because I just couldn't see it in my heart with all that was happening in the world to do that. And then I got two minutes, and you know, uh, y'all forgive me. Uh, and then um, that led to. Uh, my, my career going short. They suspended me for, for a game. They intended to suspend me, suspend me for more games. Um, but for me, and I'm, I'm going to conclude, for me, I can't get to, to, to the end of this story. But for me, I wouldn't trade one minute. Because all that I've gone through in my life, all the struggles that I've had, has led me to this point that Allah has blessed me with the greatest gift, I'm, more than the fame, the wealth, and, I, and, and I, when I say something, believe me, I mean what I say. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I wouldn't trade it for one moment. I wouldn't trade it. You know, so value, value, alhamdulillah, value, value this Islam. Allah opens doors. You know, before uh, Alexander the Great died, they say he called his generals to his bedside. And they said... I have three wishes I want you, this is conclusion, I have three wishes that I want you to honor when I die. I want you to bring the best doctors to carry my coffin. I want you to take all the wealth, the jewelry, the stones that I've acquired and spread them uh, over my burial site. And I want my hands to be exposed out of my coffin. And they thought this was strange. So why? And this is what he said. He says, I want the people to know that when you die, not even the best doctors in the world can restore your health. The money that you acquired in this life is going to be left on this earth. Can't take it with you. And you came into this world barehanded, and you're going to leave it barehanded. Right? The best thing that you have, the best thing that you have that you should value is your time. You can, you can, you can accumulate wealth. You but you can never accumulate more time, right? So use it wisely. 
And we know what Allah says, Well, Asr, inna l-insana la fi khusr, illa ladina amanu, amalu salihat, wa tawa sahab al-haq, wa tawa sahab al-sahab. Thank you very much. Salam alaykum. Takbir! 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 Jazakallah khairan. Brother Mabu, acha, in koi dhari rakhe na, abhi wo award. We'll have a little uh, presentation uh, award we have uh, for Brother Mahmoud Abdul Rauf and we have uh, Brother Sh uh, Shahid Afridi. He will be here too on the stage uh, before his uh, presentation. So, Brother Shahid Afridi, if you can come on the stage too. <laughs> Takbir! <laughs> Takbir! Can we have lights? Can we have lights on, please? Lights. So we'll have a uh, couple of awards. Um, so I would, uh, if you can get those plaques. Uh, thank you so much, Jazakallah. It was so motivating. Uh, Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless uh, Brother Mahmood and all of you for coming and listening and for him for all of this effort. And We'll have a little uh, plaque. Sometime we do feel it's not necessary, but sometime it is. I would appreciate if you can be patient for a couple of more minutes. We have, uh, we'll ask uh, brother, mm, a couple of other brothers to, uh, to come here so we can uh, present them the award to. Uh, brother Afzal Qureshi, he's the president of the Cricket Council of America. He's, sorry, the CEO. We have the president also, Jeff Miller here. So. We will ask him to present the uh, plaque to Shahid Afridi. We will have a plaque by Brother Shahid Afridi for Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. <clears throat> Thank you so very much. We have a um, plaque which uh, Brother Shahid Afridi will present to uh, Brother Abzal Qureshi. He is the president of the Cricket Council, the chairman, CEO. Uh, has a lot of efforts for promotion of cricket in this um, town and in the United States of America. We'll have uh, with him Zishan Qureshi. He is another up-and-coming rising star of the town. We have another very honorable guest uh, in, our, in our audience right now, Brother Masood, uh, Masood Akhtar. Uh, yeah, he represented Pakistan in the World Cup. So um, he was also our national team player. So he will be presented the award plaque also by uh, Shahid Afridi. We also want to recognize a uh, couple of other uh, cricketers in the audience. Um, we have Muin Mumtaz. He was Pakistan's uh, first class cricketer also. We want to recognize Jeff Miller. He's the president of the Cricket Council. We want to recognize Brother Rizwan. He's the president of the Cricket League uh, in Florida. And we also would like, OK, sure, sure. So please, if you, can, if you can be seated, please, if you can be seated. And we would like uh, also to invite Usman Malik. He is our local uh, captain of the Candle Star, the team. Okay, so he will be presented a trophy by Rizwan, Brother Rizwan and Afzal Qureshi and Brother Shahid Afridi. Okay, Usman Malik. So they are the champions uh, in our town of cricket. And we want to thank a lot of others who are in the audience. Brothers and sisters, sit down. We have the special guest for all the from Pakistan, Shahid Afridi. We welcome to him to be here. And 
Also welcome all the players who came and participate here and the guests and families and brothers and sisters. And also who recognizing this whole event have done by two gentlemen here, Abdul Rauf Khan, who's, who's here, Abdul Rauf Khan. He is the one who have done great jobs to bring all together. So have the president by Shahid Bhai. He is the one who have done great jobs to bring you here and also give him a big hand for all this and welcome to the, our best player from the Pakistan, Shahid Afridi. And Asad, Asim Asad, you can come in and he have also have done great work. Thank you. And, and here I have to say a few things about the cricket. They give me one of the jobs for, let them know, cricket start 1999 in Florida, fast cricket. And we have the best players here and coaches here. I want to all the children can come in and play cricket in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We have one special announcement. We have one special announcement. Hold on. Hello. We have a surprise announcement. We have a surprise announcement. We do, uh, there, were, there were some special, wonderful kids who won the Miami Heat ticket playing with Mahmoud Abdurrauf earlier. And we have a special announcement which will be made by Brother Abdurrauf. You want to listen to this. You want to listen to this. You don't want to miss it. Okay. All right. Everybody have to sit down before you announce anything. With no taking picture, please sit down. Just a quick second. Sit down. Brothers and sisters, please sit down. Inshallah, we're going to have an interview with Brother Shahid. Brothers and sisters, inshallah, sit down. We're going to start our interview with Brother Shahid Afridi. Uh, as all of you probably get the email from me, inshallah. Last month, I had an email saying there is a surprise coming to South Florida. If you guys are aware of it or you're not aware of it yet, inshallah, we have brothers and sisters, just give us a at least five seconds so I can make this announcement. Uh, we have to thank our volunteer, those who do an amazing job today, and the uh, people, mashallah, all the press, those who came, they did... Uh, those who came here and, and worked very hard, and uh, we really appreciate their work. So I just wanted to, uh, we had an announcement earlier. Uh, we, the brother who made the cartoon, again, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, uh, alhamdulillah, from Denmark, he made the, car, uh, he made the movie again. We, we, have, we sent the email for surprise. Alhamdulillah, we contacted him. Inshallah, March 30th, he coming to South Florida. The person who made the cartoon again, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's accepted Islam. Inshallah, on in March 30th, he'll be here in South Florida in this same place. Inshallah, we will entertain him. He went to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Rosa, and he went all the way up there. He went to, made the uh, uh, Hajj last, last, uh, this year, 2013. And then he went, the only thing he said, he said, I am sorry, Prophet Muhammad. He went and he keep crying and crying. He said, I'm sorry, Prophet Muhammad. He wants to come here. He wants to make sure he can tell the story. And I would urge all of you to come. Inshallah, it will be a good event. You, will, you can find all the flyers, Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. If you can dim the lights, please. Bismillah, Bismillah. If you can turn the lights off, please have a seat. Turn the lights off, have a seat, please. It's not going to go anywhere. 
But if you are just going to keep standing and talking, then it's not going to solve any problems. You're just going to waste time. Have a seat, please. Have a seat. Thank you. I need your focus. Sisters, please. May I have your attention? We are going to lose time here. Thank you. वो आया उसने देखा और फिर वो छा गया वी आर गोनू चेंज द गेयर्स नाउ ये कहावत ये प्रॉवर्ब हम खसूस ऐसे लोगों के लिए इस्तेमाल करते हैं कि जिन्होंने फन की दुनिया में अपने फन में अपनी कामयाबी का लोहा मनवाया हो चाहे उस फन का ताल्लुक अदब से हो दीन से हो सकाफत से हो या खेल से हमारे दरमियान जो हस्ती इस वक्त मौजूद है खेल की दुनिया से इनका ताल्लुक है जब जब भी क्रिकेट की तारीख लिखी जाएगी तो उसकी तारीख का लिखने वाला ये मुसन्फ जब उस चैप्टर का उस बाप का आगाज करेगा कि जिसमें दुनिया के अजीम तरीन ऑलराउंडर्स का जिक्र आएगा जिसके जिसमें यकीन आएगा जिक्र इमरान खान का सर रिचर्ड हार्डली का इन बोथम का ये मुसन्फ उस बाप का उस चैप्टर का उस वक्त तक अख्ताम नहीं कर सकता कि जब तक कि उसकी आखिरी हरूफों में उसके आखिरी सत्रों में शाहिद आफरीदी का नाम ना आए मैं करता हूं दुनिया की तेईस तरीन सेंचुरी सैंतीस गेंदों पे ग्यारह छक्के छह चौकों की मदद से बनाई जाने वाली ये तेईस तरीन सेंचुरी जिसका हाल ही में रिकॉर्ड टूटा है इसका एजाज इनको जाता है वन डे इंटरनेशनल में हाइस्ट नंबर ऑफ मैन ऑफ द मैच अवार्ड इसका वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड इनके पास है जब ये आते हैं विकेट्स पे तो इन, इनके हाथों से निकली हुई गेंद वो फिजा में झूमती हुई गेंद चाहे रिकी पॉन्टिंग हो या सचिन तेंदुलकर उसको मदहोश कर देती है और जब उस बैट्समैन को होश आता है तो विकेट्स पीछे गिर चुकी होती हैं आइए एक वीडियो देखते हैं इनकी आपको और इनको एक कदम और आगे ले आते हैं लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन शाहिद आफरीदी आई सी की जानब से वाई इस्लाम की जानब से एक ना फ्लोरिडा की जानब से हम इनके इंतहाई मशहूर सात समंदर पार से तशरीफ लाए हैं एक मुहिम को सपोर्ट करने के लिए लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स द वन एंड ओनली द इंटरनेशनल क्रिकेट लेजेंड फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान लेट्स गिवर अप फॉर शाहिद आफरीदी शायद आज आज फ्लोरिडा का मकाम है पै कल न्यू जर्सी में थे उससे पहले न्यूयॉर्क में थे आ, वो यादगार सेंचुरी सत्रह साल हो गए नायरो नायरोबी में जो आपने बनाई सोलह साल का एक लड़का सबको दंग करके चला गया इतना लंबा सफ़र चैलेंजेस भी थे कैसा ये सफ़र था चैलेंजिंग था आसान था आज एक स्टार हमारे सामने बैठा है आप क्या कहना पसंद बसमीम सबसे पहले तो मेरी तरफ से आई को बहुत बहुत मुबारक हो उनकी जो एफर्ट्स हैं कैपिट अप ज़बरदस्त तरीके से आप लोग काम कर रहे हैं माशाल्लाह आप लोगों को दीन दुनिया की कामयाबी अता फरमाए और जिस तरह के लोग यहाँ पे आए हुए जितना सपोर्ट करने यहाँ पे आए हुए हैं तो कीप सपोर्टिंग आई सी एन दे डूइंग वेरी वेल और आ, आ, मुझे मेरे लिए ऑनर की बात है कि मैं भी आप लोगों के प्रोग्राम का हिस्सा बनाऊँ जो कि इतनी ज़बरदस्त एक्टिविटीज़ इतनी ज़बरदस्त प्रोजेक्ट्स उनके चल रहे हैं तो ये मेरे लिए ऑनर की बात है जहाँ तक आपने क्रिकेट की सफ़र की बात की सत्रह अठारह साल हो गए काफ़ी अरसे से क्रिकेट खेल रहे हैं इसमें खुशी गम साथ लेके कर चलाऊँ काफ़ी सारे चैलेंजेस को लेके कर चलाऊँ काफ़ी सारे ऐसे लोग जो मेरे ख़िलाफ़ रहे हैं उनको चैलेंज को तौर पे लेके कर चलाऊँ और अलहमदिल्ला अपने क्रिकेट को इन्जॉय किया ऊपर वाले पर यकीन और अपनी मेहनत पर भरोसा तो इन बहुत मुखालफत थी आपके क्रिकेट खेलने पर जब आपने शुरू में इंटरनेशनल अरिना में कदम रखने से पहले ज़्यादा मुखालफत घर में से किसकी आप आपको आई बड़ी मारें भी आपने खाई घर वालों से चुप छुपा के चले जाया करते थे क्रिकेट खेलने तो सबने सबसे ज़्यादा किसने सपोर्ट किया सबसे ज़्यादा मुखालफत किससे मिली वेल जहाँ तक मेरी फैमिली का ताल्लुक है बिल्कुल क्रिकेट की तरफ नहीं थे स्पोर्ट्स की तरफ थे नहीं या आर्मी की तरफ थे या बिजनेस की तरफ थे मैं बड़ा खामोशी से और चुप छुपा के क्रिकेट के लिए वो स्कूल भेजते थे मैं ग्राउंड निकल जाता था तो मार तो मार तो पढ़नी है तो उसके बाद ये था कि मेरे लिए थोड़ी सी ये अच्छी थी बात कि हम लोग कराची रहते थे और जिस मोहल्ले में मैं रहता था वहाँ ज़्यादातर फर्स्ट क्लास क्रिकेटर्स हमारे होते थे क्लब क्रिकेटर्स अच्छे लेवल पे खेले हुए मेरे बड़े भाई को बहुत ज़्यादा शौक था तारिक को तो उसकी वजह से मैं काफ़ी दफ़ा जो है ना वो मार खाने से बच भी जाता था 
लेकिन यह है कि लकी इसलिए था कि मोहल्ले में क्रिकेटर्स थे और जो भी मैं क्रिकेट खेलता था उनके सामने खेलता था और मोहल्ले के जो मेरे सीनियर्स होते थे वो वाले साहब से आके बात करते थे कि इसको क्रिकेट खेलने दो तो बस वहीं से सपोर्ट मिलती रही और क्रिकेट खेलता रहा शाहिद अब आगे एशिया कप आ रहा है मेरे ख्याल में सवाल सब लोगों का क्या ये होगा कि पाकिस्तान के क्या चांसेस हैं एशिया कप में मेरे ख्याल में टीम का कम्बिनेशन बहुत ज़बरदस्त है हमारा और आई थिंक अगर पॉजिटिव तरीके से खेलेंगे तो हम जीतेंगे हर टीम के खिलाफ जीतेंगे अगर आप जाके वहाँ पे टुक टुक करना शुरू कर दो तो बड़ा मुश्किल हो जाता है काम तो नहीं नहीं टुक टुक का मजबा मिसबा को ना ले लेना भाई टुक टुक का मतलब है कि जो आपका एग्रेसिव स्टाइल है आप एग्रेसिव तरीके से खेलें अपनी क्रिकेट जो बैट्समैन जिस तरीके से बैटिंग करना जानता है उसको उसी तरीके से खेलना जानता है अब आप 2020 की अगर हमारी टीम देखें तो 2020 में हम लोग क्यों अच्छे हैं इसलिए कि हर प्लेयर अपना गेम खेलता है तो 50 ओवर की गेम भी अग्रेसिव तरीके से और पॉजिटिव तरीके से खेलनी चाहिए हमें शायद दुनिया की बेहतरीन लीग्स में आप खेले आईपीएल के लिए दक्कन चार्जर्स के लिए खेले फिर आपने ऑस्ट्रेलिया में बिग बैश लीग खेली फिर आपने काउंटी क्रिकेट खेली हमारा जब आप लीग को पाकिस्तान के डोमेस्टिक क्रिकेट स्ट्रक्चर से कंपेयर करते हैं क्या इंप्रूवमेंट्स की जरूरत है पाकिस्तान के डोमेस्टिक क्रिकेट डोमेस्टिक क्रिकेट एक तो जो आजकल चीज नजर आ रही है वो ये कि आपकी क्लब क्रिकेट खत्म हो गई है क्लब क्रिकेट और स्कूल की क्रिकेट खत्म हो गई है तो जहरी बात है बच्चे को अगर नौ साल दस साल या आठ साल की उम्र में अगर वो उसको फैसिलिटीज नहीं मिलेंगी स्कूल के अंदर अपॉर्चुनिटी नहीं मिलेगी तो वहाँ से टैलेंट ख़त्म ज़ाया होना शुरू हो जाता है तो हमारी प्रॉब्लम ही यही है कि हमने स्कूल की क्रिकेट पे तोज्जो नहीं दी स्कूल की क्रिकेट बहुत ज़्यादा मम्मी डैडी टाइप के हो गए ठीक है आप बच्चों को पढ़ाएं लेकिन ज़रूरी नहीं है कि आपका हर बच्चा डॉक्टर या इंजीनियर ही बने वहाँ पर अगर अपॉर्चुनिटी हो तो क्रिकेट क्रिकेटर या फुटबॉलर या स्कॉश प्लेयर भी बन सकता है शुक्रिया टेस्ट क्रिकेट आपने वक्ता फ वक्ता जवाब दिए हैं कप्तानी क्यों छोड़ दी टेस्ट क्रिकेट की एकदम से ऑस्ट्रेलिया का सीरीज चल रही थी सेकेंड टेस्ट में आके आपने जो है कप्तानी एकदम से आपने छोड़ दी क्या वजह थी खैर मैं टेस्ट क्रिकेट खेलना भी नहीं चाह रहा था ना कप्तानी करना चाह रहा था एजाज भट्ट साहब की बहुत ज़्यादा रिक्वेस्ट पे मैंने दोबारा टेस्ट टीम के लिए वापस आया और मुझे पता था कि मैं पाँच दिन मेरे लिए बहुत ज़्यादा है टेस्ट क्रिकेट में बहुत बोरिंग महसूस करता हूँ मेरे ख्याल में इसलिए कि वन और ट्वेंटी बहुत ज़्यादा हो गई थी तो टेस्ट पर इतना दिल नहीं चाह रहा था लेकिन मेरा डिसीजन उस वक्त ये गलत था कि मैं पहली टेस्ट मैच के बाद मैंने कप्तानी छोड़ दी एटलीस्ट मुझे दूसरा टेस्ट मैच सीरीज़ ख़त्म करके फिर कप्तानी छोड़नी चाहिए थी ये मेरी गलती है बहुत सारे स्टेरियो हैं आप थोड़ा क्रिकेट से हट के आते हैं बहुत सारे स्टेरियो क्रिकेटर्स के हवाले से खसूस बड़े खान साहब के ज़माने में इमरान खान साहब के ज़माने में थे एक स्टेरियो था कि जी क्रिकेटर्स बड़ी देर से शादियां करते हैं आपने क्रिकेट के इंटरनेशनल एरिना में कदम रखते ही दो तीन साल में शादी कर डाली क्या वालदे का प्रेशर था या आपकी खुद की मर्जी थी कि अब मैं इस जगह पर कामयाबी के झंडे गाड़ दूँ क्या वजह थी बस जल्दी शादी करने का यही था कि अगर ठीक नहीं चलेगी तो दूसरी भी कर लूँगा ताकि मेरे पास टाइम ताकि टाइम तो हो ना मेरे पास अब पचास साल की उम्र में तो शादी नहीं कर सकते दूसरी बिल्कुल 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 लेकिन अलहमदिल्ला एम वेरी हैप्पी एम वेरी लकी कि मुझे दूसरा स्टीरो टाइप बड़े खान साहब के ज़माने में एक क्रिकेटर का होता था हमने देखा था सोने की एक जंजीर गले में पहनी हुई हाथ में एक कड़ा लंबे लंबे बाल बड़े एक्शन से आके बॉलिंग करना लेकिन फिर हम शायद आफरीदी को देखते हैं चाहे मोहाली का क्रिकेट ग्राउंड हो या लॉर्ड्स का क्रिकेट स्टेडियम टीम के साथ अल्लाह रब्बुल रबुल्ज़त के सामने सजदा नशीन बा जमात नमाज इतनी अच्छी तरबियत एक सादा आदमी इसका सेहरा आप किसे देते हैं मैंने आपको उस दिन भी कहा था कि शुक्र है आपने मुझे शुरू दिनों में नहीं देखा ऑबियसली वक्त के साथ साथ इंसान को चेंज होते रहना चाहिए आप पहले सिंगल होते हो आपकी लाइफ डिफरेंट होती है देन आप शादी हो जाती है फिर बच्चे हो जाते हैं तो लाइफ को चेंज करते रहना चाहिए ठीक है आपने इन्जॉय किया जो भी किया आप सीखते हो अपने वक्त से और शादी के बाद बच्चों के बाद रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी बदल जाती है और जो कि वक्त को चेंज हो चेंज के साथ वक्त के साथ साथ चेंज होते रहना चाहिए इंसान को अच्छी बात है थोड़ा सा आपके फाउंडेशन के बारे में भी सोशल वर्क के बारे में भी बात करते हैं और नाजरन को आज बताते हैं शायद आफरीदी फाउंडेशन अब है आपने कोहाट में इस वक्त एक मुहिम स्टार्ट की और वो है आपका हॉस्पिटल प्रोजेक्ट और अगर हम उसकी कुछ पिक्चर्स नाजरन को आज दिखा सकते हैं वो आपने स्टार्ट किया कुछ हॉस्पिटल प्रोजेक्ट के बारे में बताएँ कोहाट में ही क्यों आपने स्टार्ट किया वो प्रोजेक्ट और क्या मकसद है उसका मेरे वाल साहब के इंतकाल के बाद मैंने कहा सोचा कि कोई ऐसा काम होना चाहिए जिससे लोगों को फ़ायदा हो और गाँव से इसलिए शुरू किया मैंने कि शहरों में सारे फैसिलिटीज़ हैं हर किस्म की फैसिलिटीज़ है लोगों के पास गांव में नहीं है और गांव
क्यों ना उनको एक फैसिलिटीज दी जाए और मेरे ख्याल में वहां पे जो जहां मैं हॉस्पिटल शुरू किया है वहां पे एक प्रेग्नेंट औरत दो दो पहाड़ चढ़ के उतर के हॉस्पिटल जाना ये तो एक माई बेहतर जानती है कि क्या हालत होती है तो मेरे ख्याल में मेरे नजदीक ये बहुत बड़ा काम था और इसके साथ साथ जो भी बेसिक हेल्थ फैसिलिटीज है इसलिए कि वहां पर मेडिसन लेने के पैसे नहीं है लोगों के पास तो हम तो बादशाहों वाली जिंदगी गुजार रहे हैं शहरों में लेकिन हकीकत में गांव की तरफ किसी की तोज्जो नहीं है ना गवर्नमेंट की तोज्जो है ना किसी सियासतदान की तोज्जो है वोट ले लेते हैं फिर बाद में पता नहीं चल रहा होता कि किधर गायब हैं तो मेरे ख्याल में ये बीना पाकिस्तानी मेरी जिम्मेदारी है मुझे अल्लाह ने बहुत इज्जत दी मुझे लोगों ने बड़ा प्यार दिया इन लोगों की दुआओं से ही चल रहा हूँ और वो लोग मेरे अब मेरा ये टाइम है कि मैं उन लोगों को कुछ दे सकूँ आपने इन तीन शहरों के टूर में इकना का काम देखा बहुत वसी काम है कुछ झलकियां हमने आपको दिखाई इसकी हमारा दावा प्रोजेक्ट तो सिर्फ एक कड़ी है उसकी आज उनके कई कारकुनान इधर भी मौजूद हैं बच्चे भी हैं यूथ भी है जवान नौजवान भी हैं बूढ़े भी हैं आपने काम हमारा देखा इनकी हौसला अफजाई के लिए आज आप क्या कहना चाहेंगे इधर देखिए माशा मैं बड़े किस्मत वाला हूँ कि मैं आप लोगों के इस प्रोग्राम का हिस्सा बना ये इस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के लिए मैंने कुछ थोड़ा बहुत काम किया मेरे लिए ऑनर की बात है देखें हकीकत में ये सिर्फ आप लोगों का काम नहीं है जो आप पाँच छः दस पंद्रह बीस लोगों का ये आप लोगों का सिर्फ काम नहीं है ये हर उस जवान लड़के का काम उस हर हर इंसान का काम है जिसने कलमा पढ़ा है और कलमा जब जिस तरह मैंने उस दिन भी कहा था कि आप सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम के बाद कोई और पैगम्बर नहीं आएगा तो हम उम्मत ही हैं आप सल्ला वसलम की तो हमें इस कलमे को हर बंदे तक लेके जाना है चाहे वो मुसलमान हो चाहे वो मुसलमान नहीं हो हमें इस कलमे को हर हर एक के पास लेके जाना कि हम मुसलमान जो हैं वो ये मुसलमान नहीं है जो हो रहा है पाकिस्तान में या और जगह दुनिया में हो रहा है या मस्जिदों में सुसाइड हो रहे हैं ये मुसलमानों का काम नहीं है और ना ये पाकिस्तानियों का काम ही ये जो हो रहा है तो मेरे ख्याल में पॉजिटिव अच्छा मैसेज हजूर की मिसाल सामने है आप सल्लम की मिसाल सामने उसी तरीक़ों को अगर काम को ले चले तो हम सब लिए बहुत बेहतर है आज हमें तालियाँ थोड़ी हो जाए पाकिस्तान एक बहुत ही मुश्किल फेज से गुजर रहा है शायद टेररिज्म और बहुत सारी प्रॉब्लम्स आज इधर समंदर बार पाकिस्तानी भी इधर मौजूद हैं हमारा आप क्या पैगाम लेके आए हैं क्या पैगाम देना चाहते हैं समंदर पार पाकिस्तानियों के लिए हम क्या रोल अदा कर सकते हैं पाकिस्तान का मेरे ख्याल में काश जो पाकिस्तानी पाकिस्तान में बैठे हुए हैं काश वो आप लोगों से कुछ सीख सके आप लोगों के पास आ सके इसलिए कि आप लोगों के दिलों में जो प्यार और मोहब्बत पाकिस्तान के लिए काश वो हम जो रहते हैं हमारे दिलों में भी वही प्यार मोहब्बत आ जाए इसलिए कि आप लोग आप लोग मुल्क से दूर हैं आप लोगों को पता है वहाँ की अहमियत का अगर मैं 10-15 दिन के लिए कहीं टूर से बाहर चले जाऊँ आप यकीन करें उस हमारे मुल्क की मिट्टी के अंदर इतनी कशिश है कि मैं 10-15 दिन से ज़्यादा नहीं रह सकता पाकिस्तान के बगैर उस मिट्टी के अंदर एक कशिश है और अलहमदिल्ला दुनिया के नक्शे में मेरे ख्याल में बादशाहों वाला मुल्क है सिर्फ हमें थोड़ी सी कदर करनी चाहिए दूसरों पर उंगलियाँ उठाना बहुत ईजी है कि हुकूमत क्या कर रही है या वो क्या कर रहा है बेहतर ये है कि आप खुद क्या कर रहे हैं अपने आप को रियलाइज़ करें एंड देन फिर इसके बाद थोड़ा सा मीडिया को भी ज़रा पॉजिटिव रोल अदा करना चाहिए मीडिया ऐसी न्यूज़ें दिखाना शुरू कर देता है आप लोगों को कि बिल्कुल आप लोगों को ऐसा जाहिर कर देता है जैसे कुछ दिनों में पाकिस्तान जो है वो इराक या अफगानिस्तान बनने वाला है तो मीडिया को भी बहुत पॉजिटिव रोल अदा करना चाहिए बहुत सारे कोचेस के साथ आप खेले आ, कोई ऐसा यादगार कोच जिसका आप नाम इधर लेना चाहें जिसे आपने बहुत सीखा हो बहुत रिस्पेक्ट हो आप आपके दिन मेरे ख्याल में मैं बॉब वुलमर को कभी नहीं भूल पाऊंगा और आई थिंक उसने जिस तरीके से काम किया पाकिस्तान टीम के साथ और उसके दौर में जितनी हमारी परफॉर्मेंसेस थी बहुत टॉप परफॉर्मेंस थी उसकी खास बात ये थी बॉब वुलमर की इस एक तो पंद्रह साल सिर्फ उसने कोचिंग को पढ़ा है कि कोचिंग होती क्या है हमारे तो पढ़ते नहीं है कोचिंग उनको पता नहीं वो समझते हैं कि अभी तक वो ही क्रिकेटर है जो पहले क्रिकेटर होता था तो ज़रूरी नहीं है कि बड़ा क्रिकेटर एक बड़ा अच्छा कोच भी हो ये ज़रूरी बिल्कुल नहीं है तो बॉब उलमर की सबसे अच्छी बात ये होती थी जिससे परफॉर्मेंस नहीं होती थी उसके साथ सबसे ज़्यादा देर तक बैठा रहता था हमारा उल्टा है जिससे परफॉर्मेंस होती है उसके साथ ज़्यादा देर बैठता है कुछ थोड़ी बहुत कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीज आपके बारे में मे भी आपसे बात करते हैं मैं समझता हूँ इंसान एक खता का पुतला है गलतियाँ होती हैं जाने में अनजाने में शायद आप पे भी बॉल टैम्परिंग के चार्जेस लगे आज रूबरू आप अपने मद्दाहों के सामने चाहने वालों के सामने हैं क्या एक भूल थी वो गलती हो गई क्या कहना चाहेंगे आज अपनी सफाई में शायद बॉल टैम्परिंग क्या याद दिला दिया आपने <laughs> देखिए जी मेरे ख्याल में हर टीम करती है तो मैंने उन्हें एक नया तरीका दिखाया है 
कि अगर करना है तो इस तरह करो खुल के करो नहीं मेरे ख्याल में मेरे ख्याल में वो एक मैंने जज्बात में आके टीम की जीत के चक्कर में मैंने गलत कदम उठाया है जो मैं समझता हूँ कि मेरी बहुत बड़ी गलती है तो मेरे ख्याल में सत्रह अठारह साल में तीन चार पांच गलतियां करो जी कोई बात नहीं दो दो हजार पंद्रह का वर्ल्ड कप अगर शाहिद आफरीदी को पेशकश की जाती है कि टीम की क्यादत फिर संभाले तो क्या शाहिद आफरीदी उसको कबूल करेगा कि नहीं मैंने जब एजाज भट्ट साहब जब वो चेयरमैन से हट गए पे जका शरफ साहब चेयरमैन आए तो उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि तुम्हें क्या चाहिए कप्तानी करनी है तो फिर मैंने कहा नहीं मुझे कप्तानी नहीं करनी इसलिए कि मैं एक मुश्किल टीम को स्पॉट फिक्सिंग वाली टीम को लेके चला अलहमदिल्ला बहुत अच्छी टीम बनाई हम लोगों ने फिर उसके बाद जो क्रिकेट बोर्ड ने मेरे साथ किया तो उसके बाद मेरा दिल टूट गया था क्रिकेट से कप्तानी से तो फिर मेरा यही था कि चेयरमैन साहब ने कहा कि अगर कप्तानी करनी है तो मैं तुम्हें देता हूँ मैंने कहा नहीं जी कप्तानी नहीं करनी दैस इट तो मिस इस वक्त ठीक कर रहा है टीम को सही लेके चल रहा है और मैं समझ ज़्यादा मोहम्मद हफीज के मशवरे ज़्यादा ना माने तो बेहतर है और मशवरे बहुत देते हैं और मोहम्मद हफीज के अलावा औरों की भी सुननी चाहिए उसे और मेरे ख्याल में ठीक है कम्बिनेशन अच्छा चल रहा है इनशाला एशिया कप के लिए बहुत पॉजिटिव हुए दैन पे ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी का वर्ल्ड कप है इनशाला अच्छे पॉजिटिव रिजल्ट आएंगे कभी टॉप ऑर्डर हमारा बैटिंग का कोलेप्स करता है तो कभी मिडल ऑर्डर वो जावेद मियादाद वो इंजमाम हक अब पैदा नहीं हो रही टीम में इसकी क्या वजह है शायद क्या हमें करने की ज़रूरत है कि ऐसे हम प्लेयर्स प्रोड्यूस कर सकें एक स्ट्रॉन्ग बैटिंग लाइन अप बना सकें देखिए ओवरऑल अगर आप दुनिया की सारी टीमों को देख लेना तो अब सारी टीमों के सारी टीमों में स्टार्स नहीं हैं पहले छः छः सात सात दस दस स्टार्स होते थे जिनके साथ मैं खेला हूँ अब आप दुनिया की किसी भी टीम को उठा के देखें उसके अंदर दो से तीन स्टार्स नजर आएंगे बाकी नॉर्मल ऑर्डनरी प्लेयर्स होंगे तो मेरे ख्याल में अब टाइम बहुत चेंज हो गया क्रिकेट चेंज हो गई बहुत फास्ट हो गई है और मेरे ख्याल में उस दौर के क्रिकेटर्स जो थे वो उसी दौर में अच्छे थे इसलिए कि उस दौर में आप 50-60 बॉलों पे 10-15 रन करते थे तो बुरा नहीं माना जाता था आजकल अगर आप करें तो फिर मैं देखता हूँ वाम का क्या रिएक्शन होता है अच्छा एक तालियां हो जाए थोड़ी भाई ऐसी की रिटायरमेंट के बाद शाहिद आफरीदी अपने आप को कहाँ देखता है एक सोशल वर्कर की हैसियत से एक पॉलिटिशियन की हैसियत से या सिर्फ एक शाहिद आफरीदी पाकिस्तानी शहरी की हैसियत से मैं आगे मैं जितने भी कोई आ, काम करने की सोचता हूँ या काम करता हूँ तो मेरे बहुत सारे दोस्त हैं जिनसे मशवरा लेके चलता हूँ कि मुझे क्या करना चाहिए अभी फाउंडेशन बनाई है हॉस्पिटल्स का प्रोजेक्ट मेरे जहन में क्रिकेट अकेडमी मुझे वो जगह मिली है तो वहाँ पे क्रिकेट अकेडमी फाटा के लोगों के लिए आ, आ, कोशिश कर रहा हूँ कि वहाँ के लोग इसलिए कि वहाँ के लोगों का जो इमेज है बहुत ज़्यादा ख़राब बना हुआ है वहाँ पर यह है कि बच्चे फारग हैं तो उनसे कोई भी गलत काम करवाना शुरू कर देता है जिसकी वजह से वो लोग बदनाम हो जाते हैं तो वहाँ पे क्रिकेट एकेडमी ताकि लोगों को बच्चों को वहाँ के बच्चों को अच्छी फैसिलिटीज़ मिले और मैं समझता हूँ कि फाटा वज़ीरस्तान ये वहाँ पे इतना टैलेंट है क्रिकेट का स्पोर्ट्स का इतना टैलेंट है ओवरऑल पाकिस्तान में इतना टैलेंट नहीं होगा तो मेरी कोशिश ये कि जितनी फैसिलिटीज़ दे सकूँ दूँ क्या रिटायरमेंट का हम ये कह सकते हैं कि दो के बाद आपका प्लान है एटलीस्ट शाहिद आफरीदी को हम 2015 तक देख सकेंगे क्रिकेट के अरीने में इनशा 2015 तक तो मेरा अपना भी इरादा है कि इन 2015 तक क्रिकेट खेलूंगा और अच्छे लेवल पे तगड़े फिटनेस आपकी अच्छी होनी चाहिए परफॉर्मेंस अच्छी होनी चाहिए तब मज़ा आता है अपने आप को उसके बाद 2015 के बाद देखूंगा कि मैं कहाँ स्टैंड करता हूँ आवाम से पूछूंगा कि मुझे क्रिकेट खेलनी चाहिए कि नहीं खेलनी चाहिए ज़बरदस्ती नहीं करूँगा शायद यंग प्लेयर्स में मेरे ख्याल में आप इंटरव्यू के अख्तामी घड़ियों को हम पकड़ते हैं क्योंकि वक्त बहुत हो चला है और आप सब लोगों को भूख भी लग रही है इनको भी भूख लग रही है मुझे भी लग रही है तो आपके बाद आप सीनियर प्लेयर्स के बाद अब आप समझते हैं कि जो यंगस्टर्स में से जो नए लड़के आ रहे हैं उनमें कौन से ऐसे प्रोमिसिंग प्लेयर्स हैं पाकिस्तान टीम के लिए जो आप समझते हैं वाकई टैलेंटेड हैं एक तो शोब मकसूद मुझे जिस तरह के प्लेयर का इंतज़ार था मिडल ऑर्डर में वो शोब मकसूद के अंदर मुझे थोड़ी सी झलक नज़र आती है कि वो एक बहुत पॉजिटिव और अग्रेसिव प्लेयर है जो कि मैं चाह रहा था कि मिडिल ऑर्डर में हमारे पास ऐसा बैट्समैन होना चाहिए बाकी अहमद शहजाद ही इज़ डूइंग वेरी वेल माशाल्लाह उसको थोड़ा सा अगर वो थोड़ा सा अपने आप का ख्याल रख ले तो मेरे ख्याल में वो एक बहुत बड़ा नाम बना सकता है इसके अलावा नया टैलेंट आ रहा है लेकिन जब तक स्कूल की क्रिकेट बेहतर शुरू नहीं होगी आपका ऐसे टैलेंट नहीं आएगा जिस तरह पहले किसी वक्त में आया करता था शाहिद आपका बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया इधर ही तशरीफ़ रखिए हम आई सी एन ए की जानब से एट सेवन सेवन वाई इस्लाम की जानब से इनके इंतहाई मशकूर